very many seats, but there are if people would like um, some stalls here, if people can want to take them, um, you're more than welcome, if people would be more happy sitting. Um, so, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Um, uh, my name is Abigail Morris. Um, it's my great honour and delight to be uh, the director of the Jewish Museum. And we're really excited about this, the opening of this fantastic exhibition of Safari Voices. Um, I won't go on too long, but it is... Ah, there are, yeah, do take them, thank you. The exhibition has um, been made um, possible with, it's been a really wonderful partnership um, with Safari Voices UK and a huge personal thank you to Bear Lenkowitz, where they are, um, absolutely, whose commitment to this project um, is overwhelming and I think we all should give her a round of applause because it really was that overwhelming. Also a huge, great, uh, very grateful to Jewish Renaissance, on the media partner, um, and also Safari Voices, um, project supported by the Exilox Foundation, Casey Shasha and Shoresh. So a huge thanks to them um, because this exhibition is such an important project and it wouldn't have had the prominence and this recognition without your help. Um, so we at the museum, we want to exist to tell stories and tell the history of Jews from all backgrounds. And to achieve our vision of a more tolerant world and one that embraces and recognises the benefits of diversity, it really is vital that we tell the stories, not just of Sephardi communities, but also that, that, that we share them as widely as possible for future generations. And we'll, you're going to hear a little bit more from other people, but I just think in a world where sometimes things are very black and white, I think this exhibition is very beautifully colourful and beautifully nuanced that Jews and lived in these countries, and it's often an untold story, and it's a really important one that's for so, such a long time, and Jews have such a strong connection to, to all those countries in, in, in Mizrahi and Sephardi uh, countries. So, but first of all, I'm going to introduce, are you going first, Alec? Um, yeah. um, Alec Nakamuli, who is Chair of Sephardi Voices, and then uh, we're going to hear from there in a moment. So right, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Abigail. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for coming. Above all, a few words of thanks to Judy and David Dangour, whose Dangour Education Foundation have made this exhibition possible. Also, I must say, words of thanks to the Jewish Museum. Abigail, Joanne, it has been tremendous and very stimulating to work with you, and I believe that we have both learned a lot from each other. The idea of recording testimonies of Jews, of Jews exiled from the Arab world and Iran originated with Dr. Henry Green from the University of Miami. We here at Sephardi Voices UK are focusing on the ones who resettled in the UK. Those were thriving communities. They go back thousands of years. They produced great rabbis and thinkers. Saadia Ben Joseph, who became the Gaon of the Academy at Sura, Maimonides, as you know, who lived and died in Cairo, Yaakov Abu Hazira from Morocco, and Yosef Haim from Iraq. Also those communities, and this is not often well known, they contributed enormously to the cultural and to the economic development of those countries. When Iraq gained independence in 1932, it was Eskel Sassoon, who was Minister of Finance, who negotiated the royalties for the oil with the uh, oil majors, and he pegged them to gold. In Egypt, similarly, it was uh, Aslan Katawi Pasha, who was one of the founders of the Waft Egyptian Independence Party from Egypt, who became the first Minister of Finance. In Alexandria, where I was born, it was Joseph Smuha, who cleansed all the marshland and the swamps around Alexandria and built the model uh, Smuha Garden City. From a cultural point of view, one of the moguls of Egyptian cinema was Togo Mizrahi, and Egyptian cinema was Hollywood to the Arab world. And one of the stars was Leila Murad, who even she was the one who was chosen in 1952 to sing the song of the revolution instead of, for instance, Um Kalsu. However, today it's a very sad picture. There are countries like Algeria, Syria, Libya, Sudan, who have achieved what Hitler failed to achieve, to be Juden Rhein, cleansed of Jews. There are no Jews left in those countries. 
<coughs> if you look at other communities, you look at Iraq, 30% of the population of Baghdad was Jewish at the turn of the 20th century. There are five Jews left in Iraq today. In Egypt, where I was born, the community peaked at about 85,000, and, and there are today about 12 Jews left. Only in three countries, in Iran, in Tunisia, and Morocco, do we have what we could call normal Jewish communities with functioning synagogues and kashrut. So it is essential that we preserve these memories of family, religious traditions, exile, resettlement in the UK, and identity. For two reasons. First of all, for research, for education. Even I am amazed at how little the European Ashkenazi Jews know about the Jews from the Middle East. When I tell people I was born from Egypt, I was twice told, but didn't all the Jews leave with Moses. <laughs> and especially for our children and for our grandchildren. The other reason is that a lot of these countries are today trying to erase our passage and our contribution from their history. They are trying to airbrush out of that region, and that is why it is essential that we preserve these memories. So today in the UK, we have conducted something like 80 interviews. We have produced 10 short films, and you can see quite a few of them around here. But time is not on our side. Memories are fading. The elders who were the ones who left those countries, the first generation, are unfortunately departing. So time, as I said, is not on our side. I was born in Egypt, as I told you, and I today kick myself that I did not ask my parents more and our uncles and cousins about our family, our origins, our traditions. So we should not allow our children to reproach to us or hold against us later that we did not enough to preserve these memories. So please help us by, first of all, accepting to be interviewed and also by providing some financial support. Thank you very much. I will now going to hand over to our director, Bea Lefkowitz, who was the co-curator of the exhibition with Joanne Rosen. Thank you, Alec. Ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Levy. I'm joining my colleague, Alec Nakamuli, in welcoming you to our Sephardi Voices exhibition. I'm very pleased to see so many of our supporters and interviewees in this room tonight because without them, this exhibition would not have been possible. And I'm particularly happy to welcome Mr. Isaac Eleni, who is our oldest interviewer with 98. So, so I would like to express my deepest gratitude to the Exilag Foundation, the Casey Shasha Foundation, and the Shores Trust for realizing the value of a project like Sephardi Voices. And I'd like to thank our interviewees to be, uh, to be brave enough to share their stories which often are traumatic and upsetting as they deal with displacement and ruptures. This exhibition is a watershed moment for Sephardi Voices UK. We are presenting to you the fruits of our labor, and I'm very pleased to tell you that we're also launching our new website tonight. So please, when you go home, have a look and let us know what you think. And I also would like to thank really my team of Sephardi Voices, our cameraman, Frank, who is busy here, uh, Simon, our editor, who couldn't be here, Sharon Rappaport, who uh, is in Israel at the moment, uh, all the trustees and Alec for all their help in, uh, in the project and in putting this together. Both the exhibition and the website illustrate the enormous potential of the filmed interviews and photographs for education in the widest sense. While the entire interviews are available at the British Library, today you're getting a small taste of the Sephardi Voices UK archive you'll be able to watch a small number of edited interviews and see the wonderful photos from the interviewees' family archives. What a treasure trove. We could have filled many more walls of the museum. The discipline of oral history emerged in the UK in the 1970s to gather the stories of people whose stories have not been told to create a history from below. So it is very much in the true spirit of oral history that we are collecting the often forgotten stories of Jews from North Africa, the Middle East, and Iran, and make these stories a part of British Jewish history. I think a reason why many of the Sephardi Mizrahi Jewish refugees and migrants did not want to dwell on their past is on the one hand a sense of resilience, and on the other a sense of trauma, the trauma of forced migration. One of our interviewees, who is here tonight, 
Uh, Mrs. Jocelyn Trago from Algeria, she says in the interview, if you allow me to quote, wherever you are, quote, don't look back on the past, look onto the future. Just make the best of our life, of your life, and don't pine too much, because then you just don't move forward. While it is sometimes difficult to look back uh, for an individual, we, on a collective level, have an obligation to look into the past and ensure that the Sephardi Mizrahi heritage is not lost. One of our interviewees, Soli Levy, born in Lebanon, finishes the interview by saying, and I quote again, what I want is for my grandchildren to really remember me and my family, backwards, with our history, and I'd like them to keep this tradition and pass it on. This statement encapsulates the mission of Sephardi Voices UK perfectly. Our work needs to ensure that the interviewees' lives will be remembered backwards, through the history of the communities from which they come from, came from, and through their journeys of displacement, migration, and resettlement. On a personal level, I will tonight remember one of our interviewees, a wonderful man called Julian Sofer, born in Baghdad, who passed away this week. I'm grateful that he shared his life story with us, and I'd like to dedicate this evening to him. Thank you. Um, and it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome David Dangor, who's a supporter of um, this exhibition and also a great friend and supporter of the museum. We really couldn't exist without his support. And he's going to greet us in a particularly special way, I hope. Ah, oh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to let you off the hook. So, um, I was challenged um, to speak in Arabic. Of course, you'll all understand <laughs> it. So, I decided to compromise by uh, greeting you all. Um, so, Hacham Levi, Sayyidati, Sadati, Anasati, which just means uh, ladies, gentlemen, and young ladies. So, that's the way it's uh, often done. But um, to the serious matter of um, expressing my appreciation for this wonderful exhibition, I think uh, Beer and the Jewish Museum and everyone connected um, ought to be very proud. It has a huge impact when you come in. I think there's a lot of material there you can spend hours, and I am myself heartened by the fact that the Jewish Museum has many people of different backgrounds, from schools, from other organizations coming here. And why I've been keen to support um, the Safari Voices for some time is that it, it works on so many different strands. The obvious strand is one that Alec mentioned, that often when you say, I'm a Jew from Iraq, they say, no Jews in Iraq, how can that be? And this is our testament. But I think it's significant also that all of this is now being done in the English language. And to me, it, it uh, of course, partly speaks to the fact that uh, we have moved on. But it does show that Jews throughout history, throughout the world, have been used to uprooting themselves and settling again, and this is what we do. We don't uh, spend too much time uh, decrying the past. We get on and rebuild our lives, and I think part of Sephardi Voices and the effort made to preserve the memory at this stage is a testament to how the fact that we all uh, uh, preserve our lives. But there are other strands that I find very uh, important. Uh, one of them is that a lot of the testimony of these recordings speaks about the wonderful coexistence that used to exist in the Middle East, and which sadly does not exist now. Um, and, and I don't think the Middle East will be right again until they learn once again to, to uh, follow that wonderful coexistence that uh, a few hundred years ago uh, they, they led the world in. So that's another important aspect to me of Sabati Voices. And the final one is that poignantly these testimonies are not just about uh, Jews from Arab lands, they're not even about similar testimonies of other Jewish communities that have been recruited. Today they are about refugees from so many countries in the world, from so many religions, whether it be the Copts in Egypt or the Christians in Iraq now, or there's a whole long list. So I think the work of Sephardi Voices is very important, and I'm very happy to see you all here tonight supporting it. Thank you. And uh, we're
we're very honoured uh, indeed to have uh, Rabbi Levy here who is going to speak now, so thank you. tonight. Uh, I have uh, admired what Bear has been doing for a number of years. Bear and Malcolm have been uh, good friends of ours for many years. They have three uh, children, Alexander, Benjamin and Julian, are pupils of Naima JPS and hence I had the opportunity to meet her on many occasions when she told me of the marvelous work that she's doing. Um, I suppose I have something to say. Because I left Gibraltar when I was 12 years old, that is 65 years ago, and since then, when I started going to Lauderdale Road Synagogue, I have been intimately involved with the Sephardi communities of this country. And of course, it is important to point out that any large wave of immigration into England after the Second World War has been Sephardi immigration. And for that reason, we play a very important part in the life of this country. Oriental Jews started to come to England in the 19th century and even before, whether from Morocco, from Iraq, from Egypt, or from India. But those that came were not the poor people. They were the established ones who, when they came here, what they wanted to do was to be as English as possible and forget their origins. Sometimes they were members of the Spanish and Portuguese community, but sadly, often they were not and they simply assimilated into English society. Um, there are many people we can quote, but let me give you just one example. When the Sassoons came to England, there was one religious one, a rabbi Sassoon's father, but Reuben Sassoon, whose father was still wearing what we called in Morocco a jilaba, what do you call it in Iraq? <laughs> yes. Totally Jewish, and his son Reuben, who became very friendly with King Edward VII, looked just like King Edward VII. There's a spy cartoon where you see him sitting down, it's at Lord Road Synagogue, looking just like his friend. And they were very proud. The Sassoon family, for example, the only one that remained religious was Rabbi Sassoon. And when the Jews started coming to this country in 1948, he was able to establish the Jews from India, of Iraqi origin, who came here uh, to uh, be able to help them and to establish them in this country. Many of them came with very little, and some came with more. And never forget, we had one who helped the Indian community a lot, Mr. J.R. Jacob. He came from Calcutta. He was a well-to-do man, he lived in St. John's Wood, and I would see him from time to time, and once he told me, Rabbi Levy, I want you to know that my house in Calcutta is still there with 17 servants, <laughs> and whenever you want to go and have a holiday there, you are very welcome to do so. I never took up the offer. <laughs> but why did he do this? He did it because he didn't want his 17 loyal servants to be without a job. And that shows the, the mind of the, some of these Sephardi Jews, how they cared deeply for the people they were working with. So what else can I say? Then Jews started coming from Turkey and Greece or carpet exhibition, they were tapeteros, as we say in Spanish. They came with very little. The Spanish and Portuguese community helped them a lot. And I never forget one of their stories. 
They became impoverished, very impoverished. Our community helped them. And they would sit down for lunch. And all they had was soup and bread. And suddenly somebody would knock at the door, coming in for a meal. And they would say, no importa, mas agua para la olla. Put more water into the soup. Oh. A few more people came, mas agua para la olla. Put more water in the soup. That is friendship and how you work with each other. The Indians also did very well here in 1956. I was a young boy of 17 when all the Jews came from Egypt and they established themselves. Uh, and uh, really, when did the Oriental community started to be proud of what they were and not just assimilated either into non-Jewish society or into the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, which was very anglicized. And I believe that was 1967, the 50th anniversary now of the Six Day War. On that occasion, Hacham Gaon held a service at Bevis Marks. It was packed to capacity. And there were two speakers, Sir Alan Mokata, a high court judge, which today there are many Jews who are high court judges, but in 67 there weren't. Terribly English, a fine person, I had great respect for him. And the other one was Leon Tamam. Leon Tamam, who came from Egypt and Sudan. And the speeches went something like this. Sir Alan Mokata said, ladies and gentlemen, whether or not we believe that on occasions Israel might have acted differently, on reflection, I think we would say that this is the time when we have to support the Jewish people in Israel. And then Tamam gets up. He says, ladies and gentlemen, Nasser, may he be cursed. Amen, amen. And that, I believe, was the transition period. And from then, thank God we can say that the Oriental community has played such an important part in the life of Jewry today. It was after that that the Sephardim came forward and did even more. In UJIA, David Sala did a tremendous amount. So Naim Dango worked with his magazine Scribe to be able to show the people what their traditions were and not to lose them. And he worked incessantly in that and many other schemes to develop that. Mr. Casey Shasha's foundation, similarly, and you, the Shamoons with Naima JPS, you carry on naming them. Whatever developments have occurred in this country, in the Jewish community for the Sephardim, would not have occurred without the financial support of all these Oriental Jews. I always say that, you know, 60 years ago, the Spanish and Portuguese community was getting a little bit worn. There were difficulties. There was no money. I compared it to the Duke of Marlborough. When his castle was becoming a little bit seedy, he brought over an American heiress. <laughs> and exactly the same happened to the Spanish and Portuguese community of this country. So we thank them all for all that they have done to revive Sephardi life in this country. And this exhibition is testimony of what they have done in the last few years. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you are 
gasping to have a drink and even more excited about watching uh, the, the video. So I won't say, that. I'll just say very briefly what I was going to say a bit more in length. We do, as David Dangle said, we do work with thousands and thousands of school kids, of over 20,000 kids a year, 96% aren't Jewish. Um, we have 70% 70, uh, 70, uh, of our adult audiences aren't Jewish. We're a very important place that, that challenges prejudice and builds, builds bridges. We don't get any statutory um, money from the government. We get certain amounts uh, from the Arts Council and we're hoping to get some more. Um, but uh, we do totally rely on the support of people like yourselves. So if anybody would like to help, um, Emma is around, Ollie is around, Kim is around, the WAVE um, development. Um, friends, any sort of support is incredibly welcome and you will help us build fantastic exhibitions but also build a better and more tolerant world. So thank you.